to today's Community Data Programs webinar. My name is Mary and I am your host today. So thank you all for joining us. I want to say welcome to today's presenter. We have Lucas Reinhardt and his colleague Sarah Laflamme may also be joining us later on and helping to answer some questions. So if you hear from Sarah, that's who she is. Uh, Lucas is a senior analyst and at Policy and Operations in the Data Exchange at Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation or CMHC. Uh, his colleague Sarah Laflamme is a senior specialist also on the data exchange team and is helping to lead this project that you're going to hear about today. So they're going to present to you the core need finder prototype. So it's in the title, it is a prototype. It's something they're currently developing. So the goal of today's session is to introduce to you the tool and also to get some feedback so that they can move further along in developing this application. So Lucas is going to present some information. He's got some slides to share with you about the prototype. And then he's going to give you a bit of a live tour through the prototype. At any point, you can feel free to ask questions by typing into the chat box and Lucas will try to answer them as we go along. And then we'll have some time at the end too for just some Q&A. Uh, at one, when we're done, our um, screen share of the tour of the prototype. Uh, Lucas also has some questions for you. So I've put them up as poll questions and we'll bring them up as part of our discussion. Um, but really it's going to be very valuable for him to hear from you and he's quite excited um, from our conversations we've had before in setting up this webinar. Um, he'd really like to hear how you see this being useful and where they should take it. So they're looking for some direction here. Um, at this point, I'd really encourage you to make your screen full screen because once we get into sharing the prototype, there is some fine details and some fine lettering that would be very helpful to have it as big as you can make it. And Lucas is also going to do his best to describe to you what's going on uh, for those of you who are working on smaller screens. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, please type in the chat box too, and we will do our best to um, address those as we go along. And now I'll hand it over to Lucas, and he's going to share his screen so he can show you what his team has been working on over at CMHC. So give us a second while we do our switch over here. So go ahead, Lucas. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so Scott here. chat box as well and let me know when folks can see that so we can see it so okay. yep we can see that Lucas and if you go into presenter mode right now I can see your slides at the side so if you hit into presenter there you go awesome good shape all right thanks go for it Lucas thank you very much yes yeah, so my name is Lucas Reinhardt and I'm from CMHC's housing data exchange team uh, today as, as Mary mentioned I'm going to be taking you through our tentatively titled core need finder prototype um, it's, we're calling it Core Need Finder for now, as that's kind of the placeholder name. So you might see down the line the name change. Uh, but what we're really looking to do is really uh, get an understanding of, of the value of this uh, type of tool to uh, a broader audience uh, in, say, the housing, um, housing market or housing industry, or even just broadly to, say, Canadians in general, to, to see, okay, what, uh, what type of tools are uh, different groups looking for? Um, what are some of their needs? Better understand those needs, and what kind of tools can we provide back to, <clears throat> excuse me, to users to help fill in data gaps or to help them make better decisions in the housing space? Um, <clears throat> so what you're seeing today is a prototype that we're currently working on, working towards uh, industrializing. Um, I'll also take you through some of our our journey as well and and the strategy around what we're up to. Um, so in terms of what we're talking about today, as I mentioned, and glad to see folks are just have a general interest in what CMHC is up to. Um, we will be covering, uh, I will be covering with you uh, CMHC strategy, give you some information on, on why we're doing this, uh, what we're hoping to achieve by doing it, what we're expecting to see as an outcome by, uh, by pursuing this strategy. Uh, this might be um, new, or excuse me, old information to some of you, but I figure it is valuable just to fill in that question of, uh, of, of what we're, or why we're, we're active in this space. I'll also take you through uh, some background information on the housing data exchange. Uh, including covering some of our other applications to give you an idea of uh, what our role is at CMHC and, and what we're uh, working on uh, in the space as well. Because um, I imagine there's some other connections to some of uh, of your work or some uh, items of interest that you might be able want to might want to be aware of as as we move forward. As well as just a brief overview of our uh, prototype mapping tool, our Core Need Finder tool, um, and its relationship to some other tools at CMHC that we're working on. 
um, specifically a, a, an application called Urban Sim, which is an, uh, a land use planning simulation model um, that we're, we're working on and that the team has developed for uh, a couple of municipalities, uh, namely uh, Vancouver. Um, we're currently working with the Toronto area to uh, develop out uh, the tool there as well, but something that has some good ties to our core need finder mapping tool specifically. Um, I'll then take you through a, a demo of, of the prototype we have so far. I'd like to, to, to walk you through the functionality and, and get your feedback on um, some of the usability of the tool, um, some of the use cases. Um, we're currently evaluating the tool, like I mentioned. We want to see, okay, who would this have value to? How would people potentially use it? Uh, are there enhancements that we could bring to the tool um, to increase its value or to change directions to make it more valuable? Um, or alternatively, is this something that uh, maybe doesn't have a value to the, uh, to the external community and is it, do we need to change gears? Uh, we really would like to ask those hard questions because we, we do want to avoid being in the business of creating applications for the sake of making applications. We do want to fill in a gap and we do want to meet a need. Um, so we are trying to take a, a very um, critical look at our, our applications and see where, where our next step should be. Um, as Mary mentioned, I do have some uh, discussion questions and, and some polls that we'll cover. Um, I encourage uh, at any time, if you have questions uh, or you want some clarification on anything, please feel free to, to type into the chat. I do have it up here and I'll, I'll do my best uh, to monitor that. Uh, Mary's also going to keep me accountable as well and uh, call out uh, if there's something I, I miss or don't address. So don't be shy, please feel free. I I'm certainly would love to hear your feedback. Um, um, if there's Lucas? time at the end. Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt for a few minutes. Um, I am getting a little bit of feedback on our line. So if you have phoned okay. in, um, so this won't be true. If you are online, you don't have audio, so don't worry about it. But if you have phoned into the teleconference line, if you can mute your own line, um, that might help reduce that bit of feedback. Okay, thanks, Lucas. Great. And thank you. Uh, if, if I am cutting out as well, please let me know. I'm, I'm on my headset here, so hopefully it should be clear. But if you do have any uh, audio issues, please let me know. Um, Yes, and if there's time at the end, we, I'll cover uh, some of our timelines, uh, as well as our next steps, uh, including kind of our thinking around targeting um, uh, targeting an audience and who we should be providing this tool to and, and uh, what the access model should, might look like. Um, we are working towards having a more fully fleshed out application by the end of the year. Um, that timeline might change, but we'll get into that as we go. Um, so if there's any questions, if there's no questions on the agenda, I'll pop right into it, but I'll pause there for a quick sec and see how people feel uh, and if there's any questions at this point. Okay, great. And feel free to, as I mentioned, uh, pop anything in the chat if you would like. Um, so what, why is CMHC active in this space? What are, what are some of our strategy and, and what are we looking to do? Um, so as uh, many of you are likely aware, uh, CMHC has set a pretty audacious uh, aspirational goal that by 2030, everyone in Canada has a, f a home that they can afford and that meets their needs. Um, our focus and our strategy has shifted uh, over the past couple of years as we pivoted to different roles and uh, different government mandates. Uh, specifically right now, our, our broader CMHC is, team is focused on uh, the, the goals that you see on screen here for our 2021 and into 2022. A key focus for us in the coming years is to better understand the needs of Canadians who are vulnerable. Um, this is something that we've been uh, challenged with recently. Um, we really want to understand and, and get a better sense of what Canadians uh, uh, who are in vulnerable populations, what their needs are, where they're located, um, and how they're serviced to better understand, okay, are there ways that we could uh, pursue policy um, see policy objectives, influence policymakers, influence industry to better service these groups? Are there areas we're doing well? Where can we do better? Um, specifically for our core need finder tool, this is an area that is a natural enhancement for us. Um, as you'll see in a moment, the current tool uh, includes uh, four indicators, but what we would like to do is we'd like to bring in demographic data to allow users to look at um, uh, local populations and see, okay, where are vulnerable groups located? What is the population makeup of, say, my local municipality? And how does that interact with the housing indicators that uh, we have available to us? Or are there new indicators that we need to make available to better understand the current context of our local municipality? We're really trying to understand local context and allow users to, um, to, to interact with local data. So key tenant for us is to make sure that we're always keeping in mind new enhancements and ways to service different groups in, in a variety of different ways. 
And this goes hand in hand with our next focus, which is experiment with new ideas. Again, what you're seeing today is a prototype and is something that we're continually uh, trying to do is, is find new technologies, uh, experiment with new technologies and see, okay, well, how can we make these tools valuable both internal at CMHC as well as valuable to external users. Uh, the, the, one of the core tenants of my team, the Housing Data Exchange team, is to take CMHC tool, tools and make them avail, available publicly for a variety of reasons. Um, but what you're seeing, what we're doing here is, uh, for example, today we're talking about a tool that's based in ArcGIS, Esri's ArcGIS platform. We're also experimenting with machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, robotic uh, processing automation, um, things like Power BI, et cetera. And we're really trying to challenge ourselves to say, okay, how can we leverage new technology, new ideas to really put CMHC out in, in the front in terms of the housing, uh, housing ecosystem? Uh, and this ties into our, our third pillar, which is publicizing housing data and insights. CMHC has a, a variety of data available through our insurance business, through our research products, through our partnerships with group like, groups like Statistics Canada, as well as various nonprofits and for-profit builders. Um, and we are trying to uh, challenge ourselves to make this data as public as we, uh, as we can. Um, of course, there are some tricky aspects in regards to uh, data sensitivity, privacy security, which are always top of our mind. But where we can, we always challenge ourselves to, are, are trying to challenge ourselves to make these data sets public, because we know that we might have an, a unique spin or a new, unique look at data, but there's also a larger conversation to be had about open data. And there's lots of expertise that we could be learning from. So by publicizing the data, we really want to encourage and look for new partnerships to, to challenge ourselves to say how we could be doing different things differently, where we could be experimenting or targeting new groups that maybe we haven't uh, addressed before. And so with those three pillars in mind, some outcomes we're expecting to see as we're uh, playing in these fields and addressing these fields, we're hoping that we're, we'll see people who are vulnerable have uh, reliable access to secure and affordable housing. We're hoping that through this process, we have a better understanding of vulnerable populations and uh, Canadian populations in general. So we're able to better tailor our, our programs to help these groups uh, have access to the affordable housing they need in areas that are, are relevant to them and in good proximity to key services. Uh, something that uh, Core Need Finder is trying to do is trying to understand, okay, where are our services located and, and how can we uh, speed up, say, approvals of um, affordable housing projects in those areas. Uh, second, uh, we're hoping that Canada has the number of homes and mix of housing options to serve our diverse needs. And this is really trying to understand what housing need looks like in Canada. Um, not everyone has the same needs, uh, not everyone has, not, and not com every community has the same mix of housing options. So we're really trying to understand kind of what the housing, uh, housing development pipeline looks like, um, where are areas we're performing well, um, how do we encourage, uh, say, if we wanted to challenge the traditional um, value on home ownership in Canada. Uh, what are some mechanisms that CMHC can use to do that and, and encourage people to look at a, diff a, a variety of housing options, whether that's social housing, um, whether that's uh, say nonprofits having unique partnership opportunities with the private sector, um, or even just uh, helping municipalities understand their own approval pipeline to say, oh geez, we've approved a lot of, um, let's say apartment projects in the recent uh, uh, last couple of years. And we know that in five years time, we're gonna have an overwhelming number of apartments. Uh, how can we help them better understand their approval process, time it takes for those approvals to go through, and what their future state would look like. Um, our f finally, the outcome we're hoping to see is that Canada's housing system supports both, both sustainability and house price stability. Um, this is something when we talk about experimenting with new ideas, uh, specifically in the sustainability space, uh, we've really pivoted our strategy to now look at uh, aspects like climate change and energy efficiency. And we want to help uh, the housing market specifically understand kind of, uh, or to look through at housing through a climate lens, which might, we might not have traditionally have done. Um, so really challenging ourselves to take a new look at that in that space, as well as to maintain our position as contributing to the uh, financial stability of Canada's housing uh, market. Um, so we would like to provide our lender partners with access to new tools to look at their book of business with CMHC, both on in the uninsured, uh, both in the insured space and the uninsured mortgage space to, to give them a better sense of how the housing market is performing generally. So you can see all these themes. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of aspiration here, um, and it's something that as the housing data exchange team we're really uh, using as our inspiration and in trying to tie back to this strategy. Because uh, when we talk about the housing data exchange team, um, it's relatively new. As I was uh, mentioning before the call, I don't know how many folks were on. 
Um, but uh, the Housing Data Exchange was really uh, created as, as a concept starting in 2017, 2019. Uh, CMHC embarked on what was called a um, Housing Data Gaps Initiative. Um, so we, uh, we looked at, and our research team looked at the housing industry and looked at kind of common pain points to say, okay, does the housing industry have the data it needs to make the best decisions possible? Um, where are there gaps in terms of access to data or where does data just not simply exist? And how can CMHC work to fill in those gaps or establish partnerships to, um, to bring about change and, and then fill in those gaps? Um, so out of that work from 2017, 2018, uh, the Housing Data Exchange team was formed in, in 2019. And our vision is to create a series of applications and analytical tools targeted to specific housing market participants to help them make better decisions on housing. So here, it's a, it's a, a short sentence, but there's a lot to unpack there. So what we're trying to do here is, uh, when we initially started out on this journey, um, the initial focus was, uh, and people keep asking us was, okay, so you're just gonna make data sets public. Um, and the answer is, well, yes, but. Um, so we definitely want to simplify the exchange of data, uh, but we're also trying to take that up a, a level and say, okay, how can we help people interact and understand with the data? So we want to develop applications and analytical tools that allow users to not only access the data, uh, pull the data for their own personal use, but facilitate their understanding of that data, as well as help them understand um, kind of what we value. So working towards our 2030 aspiration, um, to help increase housing affordability, help people better understand what housing affordability even means, or various aspects of understanding, say, helping lenders understand risk, uh, or understanding uh, how their decisions can impact the financial stability of Canada's housing market. Um, so we're, we're all about providing access to data, yes, but we want to take it up to that level where we're building applications that are targeted to specific uh, housing market participants, whether that be um, the general public, um, the lender community, so the financial institution community, uh, builder developer community, whether that's nonprofits or for profits, uh, or the pol policy analysts, policy makers, and planners. Um, we're really trying to tailor that, uh, that experience to maximize the usability of these applications and maximize the impact of these applications uh, on these different participants. So, like I said, we're not just making applications for the sake of making them, that we're making applications that meet a need that uh, the targeted audience really has a use for and that changes how they think or how they do business. And as we're talking about all of this, a, a key tenet of, of, of our approach is to make sure whatever data or models we're working with is underpinned by themes of reusability, standardized, secure, or up-to-date. Um, as you got folks on the call, uh, our, our experts in this space, you know how challenging it can, challenging it can be to uh, one, standardize data when you have data from multiple sources, or you have, say, legacy systems that impact your ability to, to modernize or to communicate across systems. Um, security is, is a primary concern for us. Um, security and privacy go hand in hand, and, and we're trying to get into a space where we're, we're building security and applications by design. So it's, it's, it's not even a, an afterthought, it's the first thing that comes to mind as we're building these applications. We want anyone who's using them to trust that we've done our due diligence to know that they're safe applications to use and that they're, they can trust us, say, down the line if we were to engage in a, a, a data partnership or um, in any kind of future endeavor. Uh, reusable, of course, because any application we make, and you see a number, a number of bubbles on the screen here, we want to make sure that we can reuse the data as much as possible across these platforms, um, keeping in mind security and data sensitivity, of course, but we really would like to leverage whatever insights we've provided, say, to um, financial institutions. We want to, as much as possible, make those available to the public. And the final bubble of being up to date, um, as many of you know, especially when you're working with uh, historical data sets or uh, data sets that might be very granular, but a snapshot in time. Uh, here I'm thinking of census data, for example. We wanna make sure that we build the architecture correctly so that when new data is released, it's quickly, uh, it's qu we have the ability to quickly clean it, ingest it, and then publish it so that, it's ac it, that users have access to it in a timely manner. We don't wanna create an application that's only updated, say, uh, once a year, at worst case, or say when the census comes out, it takes us two years to make sense of the data and, and publish it. We want to make sure that we can, are publishing data as quickly as we can so that users have access to it and then can use that to make better decisions. So on our screen here, we have uh, multiple bubbles uh, here, but um, I'll start kind of working left to right to just explain kind of the applications we've worked on and the ones we're currently working on. Um, the first one being the housing market information portal. Um, some of you are likely aware of this, uh, and it currently exists on CMHC's website. 
it's been around at CMHC for a number of, of years now, but um, it, it's where we publish our insights on some of our surveys. So our starts and completions, our housing starts and completions data is published there. Um, we have data on a core housing need there, um, as well as some data on uh, affordability, housing affordability, and the experience of, of seniors uh, and senior housing. Um, there are some basic uh, mapping tools that can be done there. Um, and our vision for this, and it's something that has existed at CMHC for a while, but we currently are looking to revitalize and revamp. So we are working closely with the housing market information portal team to look at the future of that application. We would like to inject some additional analytical tools into that application, such as uh, using Microsoft Power BI reports to allow users to visualize the data in more interesting ways and really slice and dice that data better. Um, we, we're looking to revitalize the mapping aspect of HMIP as well, so that users have a better look at it. And we envision HMIP, when we're talking about target audiences, we envision HMIP or Housing Market Information Portal as being our go-to location for public data sets. So if you were looking for data from CMHC, uh, we're really hoping that you would turn to our Housing Market Information Portal to get it. Um, so all our open data sets would eventually be available through that data platform. Um, and then we would have a, a series of follow-up applications that are more targeted to specific audiences. And this is where the house, housing data exchange journey really began. And that's our second bubble there, which is the mortgage industry data analytics application. Um, this application is targeted specifically to financial institutions. Um, so that would be our lender partners, as well as our institutional investors uh, underneath the mortgage, uh, or excuse me, National Housing Act mortgage-backed securities um, programs. Um, so here it's a series, currently it's a series of Power BI based reports, they're interactive reports that lenders have access to uh, where they can uh, view CMHC insured data, so data from our insurance portfolios, as well as data from our securitization programs. So under Mortgage 360, uh, lenders can uh, access our Power BI reports to see how their insured book of business performs, um, and they can get a better understanding of where they're performing well. Uh, what their uh, risk uh, portfolio looks like. So they can understand, for example, mortgage arrears data on a very granular level when they look at their insured book of business. We're currently expanding the product offerings out under Mortgage 360 so, so that we're not just looking at CMHC's insured book of business, but we do have access to the uninsured market as well. And we're trying to provide reporting tools to the lender community uh, to help them understand uh, their risk, uh, risk appetite and their risk uh, metrics on the uninsured market. Um, a nice spin-off of this, and as I talk about uh, mentioning that data should be reusable, we're currently working on providing an, an aggregate or a high-level view uh, report that can be available on the CMHC's website uh, so that the public can actually provide, uh, crunch the numbers themselves and look at Canada's mortgage market at a, on a national scale at a high level. So what this would look like is we're uh, leveraging our partnerships with the financial institution community and with partners like OSFI and Statistics Canada to provide a, what's called a Mortgage 360 Canada report. Um, here it would uh, allow users to do some moderate slicing and dicing on uh, uh, both the insured mortgage market as well as the uninsured mortgage market um, across metrics like loan characteristics. So looking at the total number of mortgage loans in Canada um, by mortgage lender type, for example, um, the total loan value of Canada's mortgage market, looking at things like interest rates, credit scores, uh, as well as uh, across areas of loan distribution, uh, so number of loans that are in cor currently originated versus outstanding, or even mortgage arrears data. So all this data would be provided at an aggregate level, um, and we're looking to provide that report and post that report on our website, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. We're hoping right now fall winter time frame, um, but just something to uh, stay tuned to. Uh, and it is an example of us trying to, while we're working with lenders, providing targeted tools to lenders, we're also trying to reuse that data and provide it to, to other um, audiences as well. The third bubble um, that you see here is a, a prototype we're also working on called Build Funder. Um, this uh, this prototype is targeted to our building building or excuse me our builder developer community, both on the nonprofit and for profit space. And what it is 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 uh, an interactive questionnaire that will be hosted on CMHC's website that allows users to better understand CMHC funding programs and uh, bridge the gap between uh, applying to CMHC funding programs and just getting started. So users would come into this tool, they would enter details about themselves, uh, name of their organization, where they're located, um, and what their uh, kind of proposed project looks like. Looks like, And from there, the tool, through these interactive questions, will narrow, narrow down and suggest to them the uh, funding programs that are relevant to them. 
uh, during that questionnaire, they're also being uh, challenged with uh, tips or tricks, saying that if they make modifications to their project, for example, say they add uh, 10 more affordable housing units, they can qualify for additional funding programs. Um, so trying to nudge folks towards CMHC's goal and really educate them on the funding programs that CMHC offers to try and help smooth out that journey and, and help people better understand uh, CMH, the CMHC funding process more generally. Um, also included in there are uh, things like case studies and success stories to help people understand uh, and model their applications on, on what has worked before. Um, throughout that journey, at the end of that journey, they're presented with um, the funding uh, applications or the funding programs that best match the details they've provided, as well as some follow-up contact information for, for next steps. Um, so that's our build funder application targeting the builder developer community. And what we're here to talk about today is uh, our fourth application here, which is, would be our core need finder application. Um, our original thinking when we set out on this journey is we wanted to target the policymaker planner audience. And it's kind of morphed as we've gone down this pathway. So um, when we're speaking about what this core need finder prototype is, uh, we originally envisioned it as an interactive GIS map that allows users to view and analyze a set of housing indicators on a local scale. So for the purposes of the prototype, we limited the data sets we had in there, um, but uh, we really wanted to see, okay, is there a value case here? If there is, we'll then uh, take a next step. For, so for the prototype, we currently have data on the 16 largest CMAs in Canada. Um, a couple of reasons uh, why that is, and we'll get into that in a moment, but uh, the 16 largest CMAs that we have on the map have indicators for, or have data sets on core housing need, uh, social inclusion, income divergence, and proximity measures. Um, so the core housing need data is currently at the census, or census subdivision level. Um, same with social inclusion. Uh, income divergence or income mixing data is available at the census tract level, so slightly more granular. And then we have our most granular data set, which is the proximity measures data. As we set out on this journey and for the purposes of the prototype, we were limited in the amount of uh, foundational data work we could do, um, which has been a, a really good lesson learned for us uh, because what we would like to do moving forward uh, when we're looking at these indicators is we would like to make sure that all of them are on the same level of granularity so that you can make meaningful comparisons across uh, across them all. Um, so at, if this is something that CMHC or that the community would like to invest into, um, when we take this to the next level to a more industrialized state or a more final version of the application, our, our endeavor is going to be to get all these all these data sets at a, a similar enough or a very uh, the exact same level of granularity, whether that's the census tract level or the dissemination block level, to make sure that those comparisons are easy to do across various indicators. Um, so it's not a perfect application as you'll see in a moment, but it's a good starting point for us and it's really proved the concept that to be effective, we need to have data at the same level of granularity or if we're, or to split up the maps, if they can't be at the same level of granularity, you need to bring in data that is. Um, and I'll just pause here to check and make sure that we have uh, that there's no comments in the chat. Lucas, there are a few comments about the HMIP. Some good comments on the HMIP side, so uh, just bear with me a moment. I'll just take a read through. Okay, upper tier municipal geographies is boundary options. That's a really good point, Sarah. Okay, because right now it's currently at the lower tier. That's a good, a very good point. Okay, so a couple of people echoing the, the need to have upper tier municipalities. And I'm glad you brought that up because uh, currently even Core Need Finder focuses on um, Statistics Canada's CMA definition, which very much reflects the lower tier level. Um, so that's, that's a really good takeaway. I appreciate that. Uh, will you model data to make it fit the variety of geographic levels? Simcoe County fits into CSD, but not, ah, oh, okay. Also a good consideration when we get more granular. CSDs, but not CTs. Yes, and uh, something that I would really like to see, and it will be a challenge for us, is to get it down to the dissemination block level, which is a neighborhood level view. Um, that does create some challenges when you're looking at uh, composite indicators like our core housing need data set or our social inclusion data set. There are some privacy considerations around that data when you get down to a very granular level such as neighborhood. Um, when So we'll have to work through that, but um, a great consideration there, Victoria, about how CSD uh, fits into certain counties, but CT perhaps does not. Um, that is an even a great point there, region-wide uh, housing authorities. That's correct at the upper tier. Um, another great point, David. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, some some great points there, and and I'm certain uh, my colleague Ian Moore is leading some of the HMIP revamp discussions. Um, so I will be looping back in with him, and and that's another takeaway for us too is to make sure that geographies we're defining here are the correct ones. Um, I know in some cases Statistics Canada's uh, geographies are very much uh, functional for a, a researcher focus, but if we're going to take this to the policymaker lens or um, to a municipal government focus, we do want to make sure we have the correct uh, geographic boundaries included. Um, that might require some uh, work by our, our, our GIS analysts to maybe make uh, composite indicators, excuse me, composite indicators based on the data we have available. Um, but it's good to know that that's important um, uh, for the folks here. Um, so with that in mind, that's the overview of what Core Need Finder is hoping to do. I got a really great question uh, leading up to the session about uh, Core Need Finder's connection to another application that CMHC is working on called UrbanSim. And I spoke briefly earlier about what UrbanSim is, um, but the Core Need Finder, as I mentioned, has a really good logical connection with UrbanSim. Um, and what UrbanSim is, is it's a, uh, a simulation model program that uh, is being developed by CMHC in conjunction with um, uh, the broader research community in, in academia. And I'm blanking cr uh, currently on who we partnered with to develop this model. I believe it's um, out of the US, uh, San Francisco specifically. Um, and if it, people want more details, I can grab that for sure. But um, so what it does is it, it really allows um, policymakers and researchers to um, model how a community will develop into the future based on different policy decisions that are being made. Um, so while Core Need Finder specifically allows you to look at, for example, the current context and say, okay, what does my current municipality look like based on, say, census data or based on the housing indicators that are on the map, um, even looking at historical trends, um, where Urban Sim fits into this picture is it's really talking about the future. So what Urban Sim allows you to do is look at both the micro and macro level. And you can see, for example, if I were to make using Urban Sim Canvas, which focuses on the macro, it allows you to pump into the model, okay, say if I were to build um, X number of transit hubs in my uh, municipality located at these locations, uh, these key intersections or these key uh, development areas, how does that change the future, um, the future view of my municipality? How does that change my transit routes? How does it change my um, business development? And all these different variables through various layers. So transit, employment, um, population trends, population movement, um, as well as, um, uh, yeah, so the development of your municipality, it'll allow that, it provides a, a model or um, a simulation of how that development will unfold based on your parameters. So really interesting is you can then see, okay, if I'd make these policy decisions now, how will that impact the future development of my community? On the flip side, if you're looking at the, mac the micro side, Urban Sim also has what's called Penciler and allows you to look at specific parcels of land and make changes to say the zoning conditions in that on that parcel, uh, make uh, changes to the pro forma design of the building you're proposing to put there and to say, okay, if I make these changes to zoning, how can I change the profile of the building that's located there to hopefully in our case, add more affordable units or um, to pursue different projects that might not have been available if you didn't have the ability to, play, to model and to play around with that. So really in terms of the connection with that broader urban sim initiative, Core Need Finder very much provides a look at the current context. Uh, it's a little more user friendly as urban sim is a very heavy modeling software that um, is not as user friendly even as when you compare it to ArcGIS, which has its challenges as well. Um, so there's some great connections there and something we're gonna continue to explore as we go. Yeah, UC Berkeley, yes, thank you, Michael. That, that, I believe that's the, that's the, the correct one. Thank you for that. Oh uh, yes, and David even linked the urban sim right there. Awesome, you guys are great. You can keep me on my toes, that's awesome. Thank you very much. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting program and uh, I know that we're currently working with uh, Bert Parabloom and, and the team to to keep connected there. So if you the team would like more, the community data program would like more information on that, I'm happy to make those connections. Um, so with that, I'll, I'm gonna launch into the demo of the, app, of the application. Um, so we can jump right over to it and hopefully you can still see my screen. Should have just canceled the presentation. Yeah, it but, looks good, Lucas. Um, and I'll so just what remind people at this is, point: uh, uh, this is the point you really want to make your great. screen as big as you can, so you can see all the little details. Yes, and I think I can actually make it a little. Yeah, that looks easier. great. Yeah. Hopefully, that's a little easier to see. Perfect. Okay. Um, so this is the the view when uh, users are en enter into the prototype. Um, we do have a, a welcome screen with links to a help documentation. We've made up a, a quick YouTube video as well as some 
uh, FAQs and tips and tricks documents. One of the challenges we found as we were introducing this prototype to folks is that ArcGIS does have a bit of a learning curve when you're first introduced to it. Um, if you are uh, new to the platform, it can be pretty daunting. Even myself, who didn't have a ton of experience when we set out on this journey, um, I found that uh, it was useful for me to create these documents for my colleagues or for a different external groups we were interacting with. So we did provide that in documentation. Moving forward, when we go to uh, industrialize the application and create a more fully fledged application, we would do something similar and with probably a little more polish so that there's folks when they get stuck know where to look for help. Um, but the default view of the prototype right now is at the national level, um, just to, allows users to, to be greeted at the um, a, a default view, also allows the application to load data more generally um, across uh, the entire map. Uh, so that when you do zoom in on a location, it's not uh, too slow to bring up those those layers. It does present a challenge when we uh, are bringing in very granular data sets. As you can imagine, there's quite a bit of computing po computer uh, power required to load all the data sets and all the layers all at once. To get around this, uh, we've turned layers off at different views. So currently you can see on the left hand side here, it shows you the, the, the current active layers. Um, so right now we only have core housing need that's active. Um, that allows us just to have a, a higher performance threshold at the outset. Um, and then going across, and I'll work you through the functionality on here, we have our standard zoom tools that you can use. Uh, so zoom in, zoom out, excuse me, zoom in. Yeah, zoom in and zoom out. Uh, you can also use your mouse wheel to do that. Um, we have a home button that will take you back to this national view. We have a location, uh, my location button that if uh, you allow your computer access, it will take you to your IP address location. Um, so say if you just were interested in your local neighborhood and you wanted to get there quickly, you could click that. Um, you also have the ability to search for some specific addresses should you choose. So if you're interested to look at a specific uh, municipality um, or a specific uh, address, you can just zoom in right there. Um, I'll go across the top as well and come back down here. But um, we have an information or about tab as well. Um, Welcome just provides uh, details on uh, the application itself as well as the data sets that are currently here. A key tenant that we wanted to continue and we're hoping to continue into the future is links back to the sources wherever possible. So the data sets that are currently in this prototype are the products of CMHC research or our partnerships with groups like Statistics Canada. Um, so all the, the detail or the data sets that are currently in the application are open data sets that are available either on CMHC's website or Statistics Canada. We did do a lot of work with Statistics Canada on, for example, the social inclusion uh, data set as well as the proximity measures data set through the Canadian Housing Survey and other research initiatives. So in its current current context in the prototype, users can, uh, can click these source documents, be brought right to the Statistics Canada sources or the CMHC sources, and they can download those data sets should they choose. It also provides us some flexibility um, in terms of what platform we use. So currently the environment you're looking at right now is based in the ArcGIS online platform. Uh, we made that decision for a couple of reasons. For the prototype stage, when we only had uh, limited resources and limited computing power, ArcGIS Online provides us with better performance than our ArcGIS test environment. And the reason we pursued ArcGIS as our platform for this is, again, to leverage CMHC's institutional knowledge. We do use ArcGIS as our enterprise system. Um, so it was just easy for us to gather our GIS experts and build a map in ArcGIS. Um, and it's something that we've been challenged on as well. Our partners at Statistics Canada have chosen to use uh, a platform called Mapbox, um, which is an open source platform. Um, in their minds, an open source route was, was better because you avoid licensing concerns and you can make it truly more open. Um, but it does have the drawback in terms of performance uh, and some analytical capabilities. Uh, some features that you have through a licensed platform are are more detailed and allow you to do uh, more functions. Um, but something we do have to weigh moving forward is our, what is our, gonna be our strategy around access and licensing? Um, and, it'd be, and we're gonna continue that conversation with StatsCan to better learn um, kind of their approach around using Mapbox and using certain platforms. Um, there are some analytical capabilities through platforms like Google that are of interest as well, potentially. Um, so we are trying to keep a, an open mind on what platforms we use. Um, so just a, a note there, but Everything that we have currently in, the, in this prototype is uh, publicly available data. Um, as we go down, down the road and as we further develop this application now, we might get to situations where we have entered into specific partnership with organizations. Um, so with, there might be cases where we have uh, a, a system where you have to log in to our ArcGIS platform or to whatever platform we're using to access given layers. So we very much see this turning into potentially a situation where we have uh, 
variants of the application depending on our partnership models, where there's a public facing tool that has some base layers uh, based on our research um, products, and then maybe a more targeted application that's available through a partnership model. Say if we had a, a partnership with a given municipality, we would work with them to develop out a specific map that meets their needs. And that depending on the data sharing rules is, is not likely available to the public or is available in some um, less capacity where we're protecting the data that's sensitive that might be in there. Um, so some great data sets there encourage folks. Um, some of our inspiration for this was the work that we had done with StatsCan on proximity measures. Proximity measures, um, or excuse me, Statistics Canada has developed a proximity measures data viewer uh, on their website and it's available via this link as well. Um, a very interesting platform, like I mentioned, they use Mapbox to do that um, and was inspired us to, to try and take this on and say, okay, how can we bring additional data sets to that kind of that mentality and, and provide additional value? So that's a long-winded way to describe our About tab, but next to it, we have a, a custom filter. This allows users to filter the data that's in the, the map in interesting ways. We've hard-coded four filters in here that cover a, a couple of indicators. Um, however, users can use the ones we've created or they can create their own. Um, they just have to make a custom filter here at the bottom. And what that looks like is you select your data set that you'd like to deal with, say if you're interested in proximity measures, and you create an expression uh, focusing on the specific uh, layers that you're interested in, specific thresholds you're interested in. We've tried to break all of the data down into quartiles so it's easy, easy to interpret and you're not totally overloaded when you look at the different layers on a map. Um, so the, what the filters do is they allow you to uh, filter out specific information, and we'll see that in a moment as well. And then this function, the add data function, is something that's very interesting that Esri and ArcGIS Online allows us to do. Um, so what you can do is you can actually add additional data sets or additional layers into the map um, that you have access to or that are publicly available on Esri's website. Excuse me. <clears throat> so for example, if you search Canadian data sets, you can see a variety of public, publicly available data sets that Esri has available online. Um, so you can select to add these to the map should you ch so choose. And you can do some additional analysis. We, again, we want this tool to be as flexible and usable as possible. So we want users to bring in data where they can. Um, so even here, if I had say local GIS files that I wanted to upload, shape files I wanted to upload, I can do that here. If I had a specific website I wanted to link to to pull data in, I can do that as well. Um, so really trying to encourage people to use this in different ways and, and have that converse, and start that conversation to say, okay, this is how maybe users are, are using our mapping tool. Is there ways for us to partner with them to uh, bring additional value, to provide specific mapping tools, so on and so forth. Um, and then, of course, we have a print option should you want to take a, a print screen or print out a copy of the map that you've developed. Um, and it, as I mentioned, all the data in, in the application is currently uh, open data. So we do have the attribute table, the underlying data set available. Um, so should users want to export the data sets, they currently can do so to CSV. There's also options uh, to ex export to other files as well, which I'll show you in a moment when we get through the demo. Um, so as I mentioned, in terms of the layers we have in the map right now, we have core housing needs, social inclusion, income divergence, and our pro various proximity measures. Um, what proximity measures are is it shows, um, say, the, uh, the distance of, of the, it allows, assigns a score for uh, a given area, so in this case, dissemination block, uh, given its proximity to key services. So whether that's transit, um, whether that's healthcare, grocery, uh, grocery stores, primary schools, secondary schools, so on and so forth. Um, as transit's a big one for sure. So it assigns a score to that neighborhood, that dissemination block, based on the uh, services in that block. Um, part of this work to help uh, look at proximity measures, you can look at the specific item you're interested in, say transit, or you can use this amenity dense indicator, which uh, creates a, a basket of all the services and says on a scale of high, medium, and low, um, how, uh, uh, how well serviced is that location? So a high being this, this is a very amenity rich uh, area, medium being it's got uh, an okay access to key amenities, and low being the, it's, it needs to be better serviced. Um, you can also notice on the map here we currently have these layers uh, grayed out. Um, that's just again to help with uh, load times and performance. So at this, at this level of zoom certain uh, layers aren't as useful. When you zoom in you will see these layers turning themselves on and off, um, and we'll get into that in a moment. Then there's our data selection tool which allows you to spe select specific areas of the map. Uh, that you're interested in, export that data, as well as a slider tool, which allows you to compare indicators, uh, say two indicators side by side, 
um, and we'll dive into that as well. We are looking to provide some additional comparison tools and um, keep, um, kind of analytical tools in some way. The slider was just a first crack, but we are curious to see where we can expand out from there. So with that said, if we're interested in a specific location, let's say Ottawa, my, uh, my stomping ground, if you will, um, we're able to type in that address and zoom into the map uh, and the Ottawa area will load. Um, we do have the social inclusion data set that you see in purple. Um, we do have for the surrounding area as well. And I, <laughs> I thought we had turned it off when we developed the prototype. Um, and we, as, since we were focusing on those 16 largest CMAs, but um, there is a glitch there where it is showing social inclusion for the other municipalities, which I mean, gives you a sneak peek to show that we have the data, but um, for the purposes today, we'll be focusing on Ottawa. Um, so you can see the data sets will, lo will layer themselves over top of each other as they become uh, visible. Um, and as we zoom in and out, uh, the, given that our current data sets are um, at different levels, so we have CSD for core housing need, uh, census subdivision, um, income divergence at census tract, and dissemination block for the proximity measures, um, they will turn themselves on and off based on your zoom. Um, so in this case, if we zoom in, uh, to, once we get to a certain point, the, you'll notice that the uh, core housing need drops off as we're getting more granular. Um, and our other layers start to load. So in this case, I've turned on income divergence and amenity dense. Um, and we can continue down our journey to zoom in to the Ottawa area and get a better sense of how these in layers interact and how these indicators interact with one another. Um, so we can see there, they uh, currently overlay. So we can now turn off our amenity or income divergence or income mixing uh, layer and we can compare the two side by side. So we have a layered approach on the left and we have an isolated amenity dense layer on the right. Um, and, and how we envision kind of this informing people's decision making um, is uh, say if I'm uh, a local policymaker and I'm trying to understand the income composition of uh, my municipality uh, in, in comparison to um, proximity measures. So how, how well are my, uh, my communities being serviced by say transit? Um, uh, how, what's their access to healthcare? What's their access to primary schooling? And I'm looking to say, okay, where am I, if I have this affordable housing development project in mind, where should I be locating it? Um, I'm looking for an area where I have a high income mix, uh, a neighborhood with high income mixing composition. I'm looking for a neighborhood that's got uh, at least a moderate level of uh, servicing, that's got access to key services that people in say core housing need would want. Um, so I'm able to try and find some areas where I see a, a darker blue being um, a very income diverse neighborhood. Um, and using the uh, green and yellow and red to say, okay, maybe I want to target, say, Ottawa South for my next affordable housing project. I see it's got a high uh, amenity dense, amenity rich neighborhood. Um, it's got in good income mixing. Um, and then if I were to click on that neighborhood, I can find out, or a specific neighborhood, find out the summary statistics. Um, social inclusion is not loading for some reason, but we can see that um, core housing need tells me the core housing need percentage for Ottawa. Again, we'd like to get that more granular to tell you, say, at a census tract level, the core housing need percentage for that census tract. Um, but you can get a quick look at the summary statistics. So I could search a specific location, find the, all the details about that location, and approach my partners and say, and including CMHC, and say, here's the site I'm interested in. Here's the common facts that we all agree upon for this site. Um, and here's my proposed project for that site. So to kind of help that journey along and help people understand what those sites look like. Um, at a, 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 a granular level. Um, so say if I was interested in transit proximity, I can add that layer in. Uh, maybe I'm a counselor who's looking to say, okay, I have, I know there's an area of uh, core housing in, in certain regions. How are they serviced in terms of transit routes? Do we need to take a look at our transit infrastructure and add additional transit nodes to that area to service those in, new, those in need, uh, to better service, say, vulnerable populations or what have you? So when we bring in, say, demographic data, that's where it could get really interesting as you're seeing pockets of, say, uh, vulnerable populations located in certain areas. You can compare that to how transit, uh, uh, what the transit characteristics are there, what the employment opportunities are like, uh, access to, say, healthcare, childcare, what have you, trying to encourage the development of your local municipality. And this is where our, our filters can come in handy as well. Um, if you were, say, looking at amenity density and you really wanted to, um, uh, clear out some of the information you're not interested in, say you're specifically looking at high density, you can apply that filter uh, and just really isolate the map so it's not as busy. A challenge we've had and a lesson learned for us is the amount of uh, visual data people can intake. Um, <laughs> it, it hits a certain threshold where the, it's just too much coloring. Um, so we would like to 
find a sweet spot where layers are turning on and off based on what's valuable or allowing users to select their own layers um, as they go rather than have everything load at one time. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's been a challenge for us and something we we're continuing to work on. But if there was areas that I specifically wanted uh, data on in this context, uh, let's say if I was interested in the downtown core in Ottawa um, and I wanted to export data related to that area, I can use my data selection tool. So I can select the data sets I'm interested in exporting. I can click my select and drag and drop. Oops. And then once I drag and drop, I can grab those um, dissemination blocks. And from there, I can export the data to various file formats and do my own analysis. And like I said, come back to, or come back to uh, CMHC um, and say, OK, here's what I've done. Uh, here's a potential partnership opportunity we should look into. So they can export it to CSV, uh, GeoJSON, uh, what have you, to, uh, to do some additional analysis. And I think that's one of the beauties of this tool in terms of its openness is it allows users to uh, leverage the underlying data set and, and do some very interesting things. Um, so I will pause there as that's uh, kind of the quick and dirty demo uh, of the functionality we currently have in the prototype. Um, I'd be curious to hear uh, some of the community's thoughts. I do. I know we have some poll questions here um, to to dive into. So I'll open up. Uh, the yeah, there is a question about the data sets and looking for um, what kind of data sets are linked from the municipality. Okay. So are there points for things like grocery stores and pharmacies and sort of those essential services? Uh, correct. So the proximity measure, uh, measures we currently have are from um, our census data and our, our Canadian housing survey data from Statistics Canada. Um, so currently that, that data set is comprised of proximity to transit nodes. Um, we have this basket uh, or overarching basket uh, uh, measure. Sorry, I'm going to clear that data. Uh, we have this um, basket me uh, composite measure called amenity dense, but we have transit proximity to health uh, healthcare within the community. Um, proximity or uh, primary schools, secondary schools, library, parks, childcare, pharmacy, employment, etc. And it's coming from our uh, Statistics Canada data set, um, which I believe is coming from um, is it here, um, the uh, Canadian Housing Survey, uh, sp and specifically um, the Proximity Measures database that we've worked with Statistics Canada to develop. So it's not specifically from, say, a given municipality, but that's something that, to enhance the value of the tool, we would like to partner with specific municipalities to get their look at, say, zoning mm -hmm. or parcel data uh, or what have you. Okay, I can see a few more. The dot, dot, dots are coming. Okay. Ah, okay. David's got a great three questions. So the COVID impacts on commercial land value. Um, yes, and... and Understanding uh, COVID trends is, uh, is a, a great point, and I think that would be a data set that would be extremely topical for us. So that's a great point, da David. Um, I think that that would be a data set that we would want to uh, include in a, f a future version of the application for sure. Uh, proximity to existing social housing is another interesting one. And zoning yellow zones. Um, and th this is an interesting, uh, it brings up an interesting point because it's something that uh, our partners in Urban Sim have seen as well. Um, when you're entering into the zoning space and the amount of uh, zoning data that is available from a municipality, um, it does take some time to gather. Um, so this is where we think if we took a targeted approach to specific municipalities and worked our way uh, through, or say a, a grouping of municipalities we're interested in partnering with, with us to um, collect the, the zoning data, standardize it, and then ingest it into a platform such as this, we could really provide uh, that insight back to say, okay, here's where your current zoning is, um, here's where some areas that you could, you might want to propose zoning changes to, or that you have zoning changes upcoming in, uh, and really creating that data pipeline to make sure that application is refreshed and providing the most up to date as possible. Um, existing social uh, housing data is a, is a great point because behind the scenes, something internal to CMHC we're trying to do is we're trying to map our uh, funding application programs and any approved programs or proposed programs on a map such as this, so that we can see ourselves where our, uh, our housing projects are being approved. And if they're in areas that meet these thresholds of say core housing need, a social inclusion, income mixing or proximity measures. Um, and it's something that we would like to see uh, how we can make public in the future to help people understand where both our CMHC programs are as well as where partner housing authorities are active. Um, so it, it's mostly just a question of um, what data CMHC itself can make public and what data we can partner with 
uh, community mm -hmm. organizations to get to bring into this. Um, and, and for an interesting partnership or an interesting model I'll point to is there's an organization called Help Seeker. And Help Seeker is, is very active in this space as well. And they're doing some interesting things and, and have uh, we have had some conversations with them. So um, if you're interested in, in looking at data modeling on a local scale in terms of services, uh, especially around homelessness, um, Help Seeker is doing some very interesting work. Um, and I would encourage is you to, to, to help check seeker that out. Um, co. Dot uh, I believe it's helpseeker.com or co. Yes, their organization is all one name. Um, uh, I've got helpseeker.co, understanding community needs. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, that's them. Then. I'll put that in the yes, chat for you them. guys. Yeah. Uh, awesome. You guys are on top of it. Uh, empty offices and shopping centers. That's an interesting one. Um, in terms of getting access to empty offices and shopping centers, um, David, do you have in mind, like, are there certain groups that we should be talking to to get data sets like that? Um, would, uh, not knowing Statistics Canada's entire landscape, would they have that data? Who would you encourage us to reach out to on that side of things? And Victoria, can you send a list of open data currently used in the tool? Absolutely, yep. Also, you mentioned the challenges of giving access to the tool. Uh, who and how will people gain access? Yes, yeah, so we're currently working on the access model to the tool. Um, in its current form, we do have a, uh, a URL that we can share to specific people. Because um, it's in a prototype stage, we're just cautious to share it widely as it's a very much a, a rough in work in progress. But ideally, um, the future state we're working towards and we're hoping to get to is that um, a version of this tool would be available on CMHC's website and users would, would log in or could log in or could just visit the website to manipulate this tool in some way. Um, so the, the idea is we would have a public facing tool and then a more granular targeted tool that would be provided to folks we're partnering with that have, has additional uh, analytical capabilities that's uh, available to those that are, are helping us out, if you will. Um, David, I've enabled your microphone so you can try to hook up your audio if you want to chat for a minute. And I'll keep you to a minute, David, if you want to chat with uh, Lucas about the possibility of commercial data. And I know David and I have spoken before too, so if uh, if it's tricky, David, I'm happy to set up a follow-up call. MPAC, oh, that's an interesting one as well. Yes, yeah, sir. We have uh, some data sharing agreements in place with um, uh, uh, MPAC and Terranet as well, and that's something we are exploring. <laughs> the nice thing about a tool like this is that uh, it's not for lack of data, which is promising. It's just a matter of isolating which data sets we can uh, can currently work with and, and where we can go from there. Um, yeah, it's a nice problem to have. So it's it's interesting uh, to, to to hear some of that feedback and yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh it's can be information overload, but it, mm -hmm. it means that we're not hemmed in, which is great. Um, but it, it brings back to that value question too: is is what do people see as being valuable? Um, we think that this is valuable, for example, to policymaker, a policymaker audience, um, whether that's on the municipal or provincial level. But is there another group that we might have missed? Uh, for example, is uh, the for-profit community, um, did they value something like this? Um, but uh, at this point, uh, Mary, should I stop sharing my screen so that we can run the polls or what's um, I think I can actually run the polls on can top. We run the polls while yeah, I'm so let's get into them. Please feel free to keep typing your questions in. And while we're working okay. through our questions, we'll just bring up uh, a few of the questions. So as we said, they're very much in prototype mode. And so it's very helpful for, uh, for Lucas and his team at CMHC to see um, what your response is to this and then it will help guide them how they go in the future. So first question up is just looking at, um, does this type of application have value to your organization? And feel free if you wanna expand on any of your answers to put them into the chat box as well. If you have any comments to go with your answers, feel free. We tried to make a few of these quite simple so that we wouldn't overload you with poll questions. <laughs> All right, so uh, majority of people, yes, and and nobody's saying no, so that's good. Yeah, that's great. Okay, okay, okay. so uh, question two. Okay, 
Okay, so this is looking at capacity again, and I again used our, um, the way we sort of look at capacity at um, community data program. And so uh, Lucas is wondering if your organization has the capacity or tools to analyze this type of data or make use of this application. So looking at high capacity, so this would be you're very comfortable using it and you'd be able to get as much as you could out of the application. Um, medium capacity means you do have some training and understanding of how you would use the tool. Um, you are able to use it in your analysis. Uh, moderate capacity would be you could use it for sure to help support your work, but you probably don't have a lot of you know, money or staff time or budget to spend using the tool. And then no capacity would mean there's no way this is never going to fit on your agenda of your work schedule. So everybody's saying at least they have some capacity, Lucas, which makes sense given our audience. It, it would be strange to have somebody um, with zero capacity to use this um, that would find their way into this room. Um, mm. But a lot of the folks would have medium capacity, meaning they'd be able to take some advantage of it. Mm -hmm. That's great. And again, if you wanted to comment on your capacity, if there was some um, particular challenge you had that you think would limit your ability to use this, um, please feel free to type that in the chat um, because it's something that Lucas and his team might be able to address while they're developing it. That's interesting Sorry, feedback too, because that reiterates to us the need to make this as usable as possible. Um, so that when users are coming into the, an application such as this, it's not difficult to navigate their um, functionality is straightforward. They can get what they need quickly and they don't have to say apply multiple filters or um, zoom in to certain areas like we're uh, thinking about maybe targeting say a provincial view so that you're not greeted at a national level. You log into specific provinces you're interested in for example or load specific provinces. So that's good feedback. Great. Okay. And then this is sort of a follow-up question to question two. We're looking at capacity and Lucas is wondering if you already use a GIS platform and if you do, which ones? As they get farther into developing tool, it's very useful for them to have these details. I do see a very um, good conversation going in the chat and I'll make sure to circle back as well. Yeah, why don't we pause in our poll questions here and we can address some of those comments and uh, most, most are comments, but if sure. you want to just chat to each one of those, Lucas, go for it. Yeah. I saw a question from uh, Kaylee, hopefully I <laughs> got your name correct, but um, yes, about syncing data sets. And I, I believe that the current data sets we're using are, are all synced in their current form, but you bring up a great point. And, and they are synced because we are using mostly census or survey data circa, uh, for example, since last census 2016. And, and I believe our proximity measures in uh, Canadian housing survey was, it might be off by a year or two, I believe it was 2018. Um, but they are currently synced, but in a challenge for us in the, in the future is building in that, that pipeline that when the new census data is released or our new research materials are published, that we're still making meaningful con uh, comparisons across the data sets. Um, so I don't have a great answer for how we will continue to do that in the future, and it's a question we have, um, but you bring up a great point in making sure that the comparisons are, 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 uh, are made in, in, in similar contexts. Um, so that is a, a, a great point. Um, okay. um, and in more advanced analytical tools, Amy, you bring up a good point as well, to look at the relationship among indicators. Um, that's something that's, uh, we've been chatting with different groups, we, we've talked to about looking into the areas like cluster analysis and, and doing more heavy statistical work. Um, and it's, it's a decision point we have to make as well as we're looking at these tools, is do we want to provide um, something with a lot of horsepower? Uh, or do we want to provide more of a, a public facing tool um, and, or, or, or do we want to do both? Um, so it's interesting to see you, fo you focus in specifically on that item and that that would be valuable to you as I think there's a role for us to play in that space um, and looking at the relationships specifically and, and looking at, at trends from a, a, a more quantitative uh, standpoint. 
Um, so uh, I, I can see us moving towards that in the future in some capacity. Um, Kaylee, again, the housing affordability sustainability score um, would be interesting as well. I'd be curious to learn more about that potentially. Um, I'm not as familiar with that work, but I'd be curious to learn more there. Uh, composite measures as well. Yep. So keeping the data open would allow you to to create your own composite measures or at least start that conversation, say, with uh, CMHC to develop those or through our partnerships with groups like StatsCan. Um, that's something that um, uh, that would be of interest to us, I imagine. And yeah, help mitigate the, the visual overload for sure. Um, Political bear. Uh, yes, David, you bring up a great point. Uh, politics always does come into to account, so um, that's uh, that is a whole another kettle of fish that uh, we can. <laughs> I'll pause you for a second, sure. Lucas. Um, uh, so I've just put the third question up, which people can answer while we continue to go through the questions. Um, but Lucas is wondering what are some of the enhancements you would like to see built into a future version of the application? And I know a few of those comments have already come up into the chat box, um, but please feel free to put them in there. Um, also those comments about the geographies that are useful to you, uh, it would be great to capture them in here as well. All right, Lucas, go back to your comments. Uh, no, yeah, that's great. Um... Accessibility requirements. We are trying to build in uh, AODA and accessible accessibility legislation in our work. For the prototype, we tried to adhere to that uh, as best as we could from, say, a, a visual aspect when you're looking at the, the impacts of, of, of the colors and layering. Um, something that when we produce a final tool, we are um, mandated to uh, account for accessibility legislation in our development cycle. Um, so we will have teams looking specifically at accessibility. So that will definitely be um, considered in a more more holistic manner when we go to publish the uh, final version or the the live version of this uh, this application. Um, yeah, and Victoria is hitting at the licensing aspect as well. That's something we're we're watching. We do have um, we are building an enterprise ArcGIS environment that does a lot provide us with some additional licensing capacity, um, but we are paying close attention to that. Um, definition of proximity measures being a walking distance is limited to the use uh, of these great measures. Is it limiting the use of these great measures to urban areas only? Um, and that's a great point. In terms of how proximity measures is calculated, it's based on a, um, uh, a geographic distance. And uh, I, I should have brought my colleague from re uh, CMHC's research team who worked on that, that aspect of proximity measures to, on, and how it's specifically defined. And um, you are onto something potentially when you're looking at the limitations of proximity measures when you're looking at from a, a walking distance versus, say, a transit focus. Um, and apologies, I'm, I'm not as deep deep into the, the, the data to comment specifically on that, but you bring a, you bring a good point and something we might want to to look at and say how we're def and make clear how our methodology around how we're defining uh, what's considered proximal to to a location. Um, and I, that's that's a great point. I'll, maybe I'll have to clarify that. Yes, Emily. Yes, you're correct. Um, it is based on uh, network distance, so it, it's it doesn't uh, account for straight lines. It does uh, take into account the road networks. And I'll pause there, Mary. Was there some good uh, feedback on the the poll? Hopefully, you can still hear me, folks. Sorry, I, I was on mute. Um... Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot you can't see oh, because you're okay. still on your screen share. Um, why don't you, if you close your screen share, Lucas, you'll be able to uh, see these for yourself. But lots of interest in um, sure. demographics, existing housing projects. We see um, some geography notes. Oh, wow, yeah. Immigration, yeah. Housing stock, okay, this is great. Great, and... So I'm going to try and take a screenshot of that. And I see my screen's kind of butchered that. Well, that's, that's, and so we've uh, got one more points. question for you folks. Um, please feel free to keep um, putting in. I'll leave that question three up. Um, and this is a, a quicker one. 
There we go. Um, so future versions of this application might have partnership opportunities. And I think Lucas has spoken to a few of those, particularly with some of the more local organizations or municipalities. Um, and so there might be some opportunities where they can co-develop or share data sets. Is that something you would be interested in? And Lucas, I would encourage you to type your email address into the chat box, the best way to contact you, because if anybody is interested in a partnership, um, this would be a great time, I think, to get in touch with Lucas um, and have a at least an initial introduction conversation about where you see this going and a potential partnership in the future. It's a great idea. Perfect. I just popped it into the chat there. Great. All right. Well, thank you everybody for your comments. Um, hopefully Lucas, this gives you an idea of where to go forward it does it does uh and like i said it's um it's good to see that it's not for lack of data that uh that uh, we're, we're kind of moving forward but um we will have to make some uh, excuse me some interesting decisions on where we focus our efforts and where we get started um i think there's uh, going to be some 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 tough decisions made as we're first getting uh getting going on what we we, we can and can't do but um, I think there's a lot of good opportunity here. Um, but uh, in terms of our um, next steps... Here, and I'll we'll actually I'll close these poll downs. Thank you, everybody, who answered those poll um, questions. Um, it's very helpful for us to capture not just our discussion, but those um, more fine comments to work on later for Lucas. Yeah, and it's, uh, as we're in the digital world, it's, it is uh, some challenges when you're doing conference calls, so appreciate uh, everyone. Uh, patience and, and for contributing to the chat. That's great. Um, but uh, as we're moving forward, like I mentioned, we're really trying to figure out, okay, what is the target audience for an application such as this? And we, we, we've spoken quite a bit about the approach of um, having a primary target audience where we're, say, uh, specifically targeting, say, policymakers or um, government officials, and then having spin-off maps that are available to researchers, academics, everyone in Canada, builders, developers, what have you. Um, and that's kind of the roadmap we're heading on is we think that um, we will have a, a very uh, targeted tool that will service one group to get us started with, with spinoffs to a, a wider audience. But we are looking to see how we can uh, really hone in on specific groups and, and, and leverage value across the different platforms. So something we are keeping in mind is this is just a, a brief list of uh, folks active in the housing space. But um, there's, of course, tons we've missed here. But uh, just to give you an idea of some of our thinking around having a, a, a primary target audience and then uh, secondary spin-off audiences. Um, but uh, looking at our timelines, uh, this is where we're currently at. We, in January, February, uh, we collect, we're collecting a lot of feedback from different stakeholders and organizations such as yourselves. Uh, in March, we're continuing that exercise and we're completing our value assessment of, of this tool. Um, and then at the end of March, we're making that decision, okay, is this a prototype we want to go ahead with? Or are we saying there's a no-go here, that we need to take a step back and take another look? Um, from the consultations we've held so far, it seems like the decision will be, or the recommendation will be to go ahead. Um, but we are leaving room to say, okay, maybe this isn't the direction we want to go, or maybe we need to make some changes. So um, we are doing our evaluations right now, and we're, we're gathering all that information. So um, it will be interesting in March to see where we land. Um, following that, we do have some internal processes to develop a business case and start the contracting pro process. Um, that will hopefully take us through April and, April and May. Um, once we have that contract in place uh, through our, uh, our partnership with uh, Accenture Consulting um, or other, other relevant parties, um, we can then de begin development of the application uh, through June into September and with a very tentative application launch in September potentially and then refining and further enhancements towards the end of the year. Of course, all of these are subject to change. It's just kind of a rough idea where we're at in case folks are wondering what uh, our next steps are. Um, but this is our, our hope for the year of 2021. Um, it may change a little bit as we go forward and as kind of competing priorities come up, but we're really hoping that by the end of the year, we have something that's uh, available to uh, specific audiences or to members of the public in some capacity um, to, to leverage this, this application. 
the prototype does seem to have some broad support. So it's just a matter of kind of sharpening that edge and, and seeing where can we make the most impact and what's feasible uh, for CMHC to, uh, to do moving forward. Um, and we kind of covered our discussion questions and I know we're coming up on time. So um, I do want to be cognizant of that with our 15 minutes left. But um, yeah, so I really appreciate uh, your, your support today. And if um, uh, after the call you have any questions, comments, concerns, uh, as Mary prompted, it was a great idea. I, I did include my email in the chat. Um, feel free to email me. Uh, I will do my best to get back to you in a timely manner. I always try to make sure, but uh, please have some patience with me if, uh, say, I, the folks do flood into my inbox. But I'm always happy to chat. And I'm really uh, uh, thankful for you guys having me today to present. Well, some thank you so much, Lucas. Um, it really is nice to see what um, CMHC is working on. And I appreciate when we have a chance to sort of collaborate on this stuff and, uh, and make use of our network to, you know, be there at the beginning before things are finalized, right? Um, make these tools a lot more useful when, when people have a chance to listen to each other beforehand. So thank you very much for including our network in this process. So Lucas, hopefully you and I can follow up um, maybe when we are ready to launch and we can have a launch with our network as well and present the uh, somewhat finished product to them and we can explore that together um, in September or whenever that certainly... next phase happens. Yeah, that would that would be great. And apologies, I noticed my connection did drop there for, for a moment, but absolutely, definitely interested in, in keeping uh, the community up to date on, on what we're doing. And... Uh, having that uh, that launch party once we're ready. <laughs> Absolutely, virtual launch parties. I love it. <laughs> Can't wait. This is uh, this is the the life these days, I suppose, with the current pandemic. So that's right. The that's reality. Right. Yeah, that's right. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate um, you coming today and being an attentive audience, um, offering all that feedback and your questions and getting the discussion going. Um, at Community Data, we are focusing on housing data for the next little while. And so we're really excited about all these conversations we're having. They're piecing together quite nicely and uh, hopefully getting a lot of those juices flowing in our ideas and, and thinking of some new ways of doing things and making sure that our data is connected and useful. So there'll be a, uh, the presentation will be available afterwards. And we also have a recording of today's webinar. So anybody who does want to um, review it, or if you have somebody you want to share it with from our, our network, if there's other members who weren't able to attend, you can let them know that that will be available in the next couple of days. And I encourage you again to follow up with Lucas if you want to um, explore any potential partnership with CMHC and be part of the development of this tool. So thanks everybody. And we'll see you back for our next webinar, which will be next month. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you.